On December 15th, I spoke with socio-legal researcher, writer, and professor at the University of East Anglia, Kirsten McConaughey, about her current research on community land ownership in Scotland and prior field work in Myanmar. McConaughey is an expert in socio-legal research and analysis with a focus on Myanmar's ethnic minorities, including the Chin and Rohingya. Her framework is grounded in an ethnographic and community-based approach to understanding violence against civilians, bridging law and policy at the macro level with lived experience at the local level. McConaughey advocates for restoring justice and decision-making to the communities directly affected by conflict and state crime. To begin, could you explain what you're currently researching? Yeah, so I'm currently actually working on a project that's quite a departure from the more state crime related work I've done before. But for the last couple of years, I've been working on a project to do with community land ownership in rural Scotland. So community land ownership is something that's not very well known about in England, but it's been underway in Scotland for about 30 years where communities have been getting together to buy out areas of land. And those can be large areas like 10,000 multiple thousands of acres you know not necessarily some of the purchases are individual assets like a town hall or a playing field or something like that but others are are really large estates and the ones that I'm interested in researching are the large um, buyouts so uh, initially that was happening kind of spontaneously but since 2003 there's been a legal right for communities to buy land if it comes onto the market And I'm looking at how that works in practice and trying to go beyond just thinking about ownership and looking at how people govern and and manage land once they've bought it. So, yeah, it's a project about ownership and property and what it means and what communities do with land when they own it. Are you visiting Scotland often um, to conduct field work? Uh, And if so, could you explain your methods? Yeah, so I was very... uh, grateful to be funded by Leverhulme for this. So I was able to spend before the pandemic about six months in um, in Scotland in the mostly kind of Outer Hebrides, Highlands and Islands areas where there's been, where a lot of these buyouts have taken place. So yeah, in that time, I was just doing interview research, spending time in the communities, uh, trying to talk to a range of stakeholders, whether those are like civil society or government or um, community owners or residents of community owned estates. So similar approach to the kind of methods I've taken in other projects, but just this time much closer to home. And of course the pandemic disrupted that chance of doing field work and although I still have some more interviews that I'd like to do I've been sort of holding on until I feel like it's safe to go and interview people because even though people are traveling around the UK I don't want to be um, you know bringing risk to any areas so those sorts of concerns so final interviews have been suspended until it's a bit, bit safer to do that. What incentives do these rural communities have uh, to participate in these land ownership programs? Yeah, I mean, it varies a lot of. So initially, when they started happening, a lot of people were motivated, I think, more by the sort of political objectives of land justice sort of ideals and trying to, you know, there's this history of the Highland clearances in that area and landlord oppression and so on in kind of particularly the 19th, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. So that was a sort of initial impetus, but a lot of it came to areas that felt they were owned by absentee landlords, people who were sort of wealthy landowners who owned the area, but maybe lived in London and came up for um, periods of time in the summer. So, yeah, um, and I guess people are also motivated by things like... um, you know, depopulation is a big problem in a lot of the highlands and islands. So there's a a kind of aging population, shortage of young people, shortage of jobs, rising house prices, because it's an attractive area for people to buy into in retirement, but that drives the prices up for sort of local young people. So there's a lot of kind of fairly complex social and economic issues that feed into this. And I think it's quite difficult to untangle. Different priorities have probably come to the fore in different buyouts, but Yeah, it's interesting. And I suppose a lot of the debate so far has been around this idea of should they purchase and and should communities be able to purchase? And I'm kind of more interested in knowing what happens after purchase, because I think, um, you know, we talk about, I guess we'll come to this uh, later, but a lot of my research has been on community and, and we talk about what community 
we take it for granted a lot of the time and the sort of community land ownership just presumes the existence of a community. But what does that actually mean when we're talking about modern contemporary Scotland? And it's in, in the legislation, it's a community of place. So it's people who are resident. But, you know, you may have very little in common with people who you happen to live in the same area, right? You don't necessarily share the same sort of values for land management. You don't necessarily share the same views in conservation. You, some of you might want to have unspoiled natural scenery. Other people might want to build, as is happening in one area at the moment, a spaceport. So, you know, you have this kind of real, I think, a lot of the time, um, divergent views about what should be done with rural Scotland and that's that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. It sounds like your research tends to focus on community level politics and political organization at a local level where people create their own social governance practices. Um, am I right in assuming that and um, can you just kind of discuss how this research in Scotland builds upon um, your previous scholarship and uh, what, what are the common themes? Yeah, I think you're exactly, uh, you're exactly right with your summary. I mean, very much the common thread in a lot of what I've looked at is this idea of how people organize for themselves. And actually it's not been as conscious as that sounds. Like it's not that I've consciously sat, set out to do the same thing multiple times. It's just kind of, I think I'm doing something really different. And then I realize that actually, you know, the same, the same core themes are at play here. So um, in some ways, the community land ownership project is a very big departure because it's the first time I've done research in the UK and it's the first time I've done research that's not in the kind of situations that the state crime initiative would normally look at. So everything else I've done is in areas of conflict or it's to do with transitional justice or displacement. And, you know, this is, it seems on the surface to be a really different um, type of project, but actually a lot of the same themes are there. It's about what are communities doing and what's this relationship between law and policy at the top, but what's happening on the ground. Um, and I always seem to be drawn to the kind of areas of contestation and uh, the areas where people might be sort of coming into conflict at different layers between the local and the, the national and whatever might be in the middle. Did the pandemic afford you this opportunity to kind of stay local and um, focus your research in your own home country of Scotland? Um, or had you kind of begun thinking about this topic uh, before? Have, had you kind of um, considered doing research in your own political cultural context before? Yeah, and I was, I was kind of fortunate that I'd started this before the pandemic. So I was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that I came to because I realized that the work I'd been doing was no longer going to be feasible for now. So I'd started the research in 2019. Um, and yeah, it's been interesting. I mean, I'm actually from the Highlands of Scotland, so that's where my parents live. So it really is for me something about kind of going back to look at things that I feel connected to from sort of family and childhood, but also taking a lot of the sort of lens that you get from international development about you know, how does policy get made and whose voices are heard and um, these kind of dynamics of intervention and deciding what to do with the areas that people live in, yeah. Uh, I want to pivot to discuss Myanmar um, since the military coup, it's obviously very current and a lot of people are discussing um, the violence against civilians that's being committed by the military regime. Um, I'm curious if you have any plans to return to Myanmar and continue doing research there uh, once your once your current project wraps up. Yeah, I mean, I still feel really kind of close to Myanmar as a research area and as a kind of area that I'm concerned with. So even though I haven't been actively researching it so much recently, although I have been finishing a special issue that I'll talk about in a moment. But yeah, I definitely still feel very close to it and follow it closely and keep in touch with people who are, you know, there and from there. And and yeah, it's a huge part, I think, in everyone's mind at the moment because it is just such a devastating situation. So, I mean, my own research, I hadn't really been doing so much, partly because a lot more people were working on Myanmar and I didn't really feel like there was a lot of people working on it. I didn't feel like I had a sort of particular project that I was... Um, that I was drawn to and also because my focus was on refugees and displacement and I mean 
the, the spotlight had really shifted from refugee issues into Myanmar and there wasn't really much kind of, so on the, I suppose it's a bit contradictory. On the one hand, there was much more research happening on Myanmar, but on the other hand, there was sort of very little happening in the space of, of um, refugee issues that I was sort of getting involved in. So yeah, we did um, the special issue that I have been finalizing we started in about 2018 and I co-edited it's a special issue of modern Asian studies and I co-edited it with Helena Ku from the Danish Institute for International Studies and Elaine Linney Ho from National University of Singapore and that special issue looks at what we call border governance and the transition in Myanmar and we were interested in trying to sort of tease out the relationship between the center and the borders in Myanmar because what we felt at the time um, was that this kind of focus on the transition. So this is, you know, we started talking about this in about 2016, well before the coup. Um, we were concerned with the way that the transition was being sort of packaged and understood as something that was really just happening at the centre. So that if there was a transformation to, you know, after the 2015 elections where you had this transfer of political power, for a lot of actors, that was almost seen as like the transition and everything after that was viewed almost as just a question of development. Um, but actually, there were still ongoing, very active conflicts between the majority population. We'll probably maybe be able to talk more about the ethnic dynamics, but um, there was still very active conflict going on in Myanmar between ethnic groups and, um, and the government and military, and those were being really overlooked. And of course, at the same time that we had this transition, we also had the, the genocide against Rohingya in 2017. So you had like, on the one hand, a narrative of success and transition, but on the other, in reality, the kind of lived experience was still a lot of conflict and violence and persecution. And so our special issue was trying to sort of draw attention to that and also to tease out why these kind of center border dynamics needed to be considered. So unfortunately, it's taken a long time to come to press because of the publication, the, the journal schedules. So it will actually, the, the articles are available online at the moment in Modern Asian Studies First View. And I think the print publication will come out in March of 2022. So um, the articles are there for anyone that's interested. In all our contributors sort of take different perspectives and, and highlight different sides of these border center dynamics. And even though the coup has obviously changed a lot, I think it kind of serves to reinforce really the points that we were making, that these dynamics of majority and minority and dissenting groups hadn't really been given maybe the weight that they should have been. I'm just curious if I've read it. Um, is this one titled Refugee Policy as Border Governance? Well, that's my article in the special issue. So I, I have an article that's a contribution that looks at repatriation policies because for the past sort of almost 10 years, refugees outside Myanmar were really just coming under huge pressure to return. And that was part of this overall idea that the country had fundamentally transformed and that really those who were, who were too afraid to return or who said there was still a risk of conflict were seen as kind of not quite spoilers, but people who were being overly cautious, who were being sort of unrealistic, who were waiting for some um, un, undue level of, of sort of guarantee before they went back. And of course, as it transpires, they were being quite rational because the risk of conflict was extremely high. And of course, that's the situation that we're in now. So yeah, that article was written to kind of draw attention to the different ways in which refugees in Thailand and Rohingya in Bangladesh and also Chin refugees in India and Malaysia had sort of all been in through different policy measures kind of pressured to return. Um, and I suppose that's one thing that post coup, almost refugee populations have been kind of relieved of that pressure. So um, in a sense, their situation, although in many respects is, is much worse as everyone's is as a result of the coup, it has at least taken that sort of pressure that you know they had to just go back um, away. Yeah, in many cases, I feel we, we see this example of transitional governments using um, refugees as a kind of instrument to create um, the illusion that their transition is perhaps more democratic or that they are, uh, you know, serious about pursuing a pluralist society. 
Um, and by repatriating people, they're kind of demonstrating uh, to the international community um, you know that 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 these people will be safe under the new regime, and that that it will indeed be um, uh, a, a pluralist um, society. Is this um, is this what what you think uh, could be could be behind um, some of these calls to return the Chin refugees to Myanmar? Yeah, I think it's difficult to tease out exactly. Um, so there were three different approaches. So the Chin, um, the Chin position was that they were given a, a, a statement of cessation of ceased circumstances by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and that's something that's perm, you know it's permitted in refugee law that refugee status can be ceased if the circumstances that gave rise to the need for refugee protection have changed in a substantial and enduring way. And, um, and so it, it is a mechanism that exists in refugee law, but the threshold for it should be very high, because if you're taking people's refugee status away, then you obviously need to know that they will be safe if they are returned. So the declaration was really controversial at the time it was issued, which was in 2018. Um, and it was lifted about a year later, sort of slightly less than a year later. But a lot of damage was done in that time in terms of the uncertainty that it creates for people and what were they going to do and, and what, you know, what possible options would they have. So in terms of why, so that cessation policy was one of the, the policies that I talk about in the article. And I also talk about pressure for voluntary repatriation from camps in Thailand and the pressure, the memorandum of understanding for repatriation of Rohingya from Bangladesh to Myanmar. And in some ways that's even more egregious because you know the circumstances that created their displacement were so close in time to the, the pressure to repatriate. And as I talk about in the article, that has happened historically too, right? It's not the first time that that's happened for Rohingya. Um, so yeah, why does why did the international organizations and donors and UNHCR want people to return? I mean, I think on the one hand, there's a real desire for a kind of good news story and refugee protection. And in if you viewed it through a certain lens, if you viewed it that Myanmar had actually changed, then you know, you, why wouldn't you want people to go back, which is one of the, the quotes that I use in the article is a, a UNHCR official saying, you know, we should be celebrating this, not criticizing it. This is a good thing. And I think there was a, a, a you know, I think on, uh, for some policymakers, I think there was that perception that this was a good thing. And it was just that people were being nervous, but actually the circumstances in Myanmar were, were, were actually safe. So I think there were some people who believed that, um, other, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it's complicated, <laughs> I suppose. And I try and tease it out in the article in looking at the influence, the kind of impact it had in reinforcing this particular narrative of transition. But on one level, I also really don't understand why UN policymakers were kind of able to say that Rohingya people could return to Myanmar when so evidently they are not safe. There were no guarantees that were convincing that they would be safe if they were returned. None of the underlying issues of citizenship or rights commitments were being addressed. So, you know, there's a there's a sort of generous good faith interpretation that says policymakers really believed that Myanmar had transformed and that they were doing a good thing. But um, I'm not totally sure how far we can extend that analysis because the the gap between what people said was possible and what was happening in the ground was just huge. What are the tools available either through international law or um, advocacy work to contest this idea that it was safe to return, um, not only for the Chin refugees, but generally speaking in international law? Um, what protection do uh, refugees have if the UNHCR suspends that status? Yeah, I mean, at a policy level, so repatriation in refugee law is supposed to be voluntary. So the core protection that refugees have is this protection from non refoulement the protection from being returned to somewhere where they're at risk of persecution. So, you know, that's the, the really fundamental protection that you have. It's that you can't or shouldn't be returned to somewhere where you face persecution. And so repatriation is a solution, a durable solution in refugee situations. But in order that repatriation is not reformal, in order that it's not just the mass return of people to circumstances where they face persecution, 
it's supposed to be or it must be voluntary and it must be conducted in circumstances that allow people to live in safety and with dignity. So those are the kind of threshold standards that are supposed to be applied, voluntariness in safety and with dignity. And, you know, there's quite often been this blurring of voluntariness and it's it's definitely happening. You're, you know, you're absolutely right to talk about returns from Lebanon to Syria as another really egregious example at the moment. But it's also happened historically and the Rohingya have been, you know, subjected to that very um, infamously in the mid 1990s as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think what you have is just the sort of classic tension between the host state that wants to return people because they no longer want this refugee burden um, and the, the standards that are supposed to be applied. So it's a question that can be challenged in advocacy. It can be challenged through, you know, re returning to the standards that exist. But I suppose at a more practical level, it's recognizing why hosting states feel that they no longer are able to do this. And I mean, Lebanon, although the, the repatriations are hugely egregious, um, the return, the pressure to return is egregious. You can also see the huge number of refugees that Lebanon has for a small population and, and not a high income country. So um, and similarly with Bangladesh, I mean, you can see the sort of furor that the British government has about the arrival of asylum claimants to the UK for a fraction of the, you know, um, the numbers. So the asylum claims in the UK, I think, is something like the zero point, the refugee population in the UK is like 0.2% of the national population. And the, the refugee population in Lebanon is about 30%. So, you know, so I think it's also about perhaps um, realizing that hosting states need support for, for continuing to, to show and extend hospitality whilst not, you know, not in any way trying to diminish what's happening in, in premature returns and the cost of that. Before we move to um, continue discussing uh, contemporary developments in Myanmar, I wanted to ask um, generally about your approach. Um, you use a socio-legal framework um, that's kind of interdisciplinary, drawing on insights from sociology and legal studies. Um, and the law itself. Um, why why do you adopt this um, kind of two pronged approach, and what does it lend to your analysis that might otherwise be missing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always quite personal about the kind of things that you find interesting and the approach that you find the most convincing. And for me, you know, what I was interested in in law is how people experience it and how they respond to it and what it means in people's um, everyday lives and. Um, for a lot of refugees, particularly in Southeast Asia, where there isn't a very high adoption of the Refugee Convention, like refugee law is, is not on a daily basis something that people are particularly um, engaged with. I mean, it matters, it certainly matters in terms of the status that people are given or these kinds of policies that we've talked about, about cessation and repatriation. But actually, people's lived experiences are much more to do with questions of safety and security and survival. And, and so for me, that it's those kind of gaps of the, you know, the classic socio-legal summary, the gap between the law and the books and the law and action. Like that's, that's what I find interesting. But, you know, it's not to say in, in many respects, I think for actually making a practical difference, purely doctrinal law is probably as significant as it can be because it's often through case law through challenging decisions in the courts, through getting that kind of legal codification that you actually can give rights meaning. So, um, you know, it's very much for me a personal thing about the approach to law that I find most compelling. And for me, that's been about trying to do more ethnographic research, trying to spend lots of time doing field work, lots of qualitative interviews, talking to you know, spending enough time that I'm not just talking to the, the sort of most visible stakeholders, but also having those kind of conversations with more less visible people um, and, and really trying to build a picture of what refugees' lives look like. One of the things I really appreciate about much of your scholarship is, um, you know, these narratives about who belongs in the national community and who doesn't um, kind of requires sociological and ethnographic insights because these are taking place in multiple levels, not just kind of at the macro law and policy level. 
Um, so with regards to um, ethnic minorities in Myanmar, um, I'm curious if you could speak to how perceptions of belonging enable state violence. Yeah, I mean, it's such a complicated question to try and explain succinctly. So I will try to kind of explain Myanmar's ethnic politics as succinctly as I can, because I think, as I sort of alluded to already, part of the problem in Myanmar's politics as understood internationally is that there's a lot of focus on the pro-democracy struggle, the struggle against military rule. And there's actually this whole parallel story about ethnic politics and the ethnic complexity of Myanmar that's often overlooked. So you have a country that's very ethnically diverse, where you have approximately very roughly two thirds or 60% of the population, which is of one ethnic group, the Burman or the Bamar. Um, and then the other sort of 30 to 40% of the national population is a whole mosaic of other ethnic identities. Uh, so you have this majority population and then a very um, complex ethnic uh, composition. And historically and presently, Burma's politics have been really defined by this sort of majority superiority. So the Burman identity is Burmese speaking, it's largely Buddhist, um, and there's a strong politics of Burmanization, which really emphasizes the superiority of Burman ethnicity, Burmese language, and Buddhist faith. And most of the ethnic groups, as well as not being Burman, uh, have their own ethnic languages and maybe other religions, so Christian or Muslim. And, um, and you know, that means that they're really at the, the sort of lower down the hierarchy, and that's played out in all sorts of discriminatory ways. So in terms of um, suppression of ethnic languages or ethnic education and um, exclusion from civil service jobs, but also really direct and extreme violence. And so you see that most kind of visibly internationally now in relation to the Rohingya who are actually actively excluded from citizenship or who you know have been written out of citizenship where the other ethnic groups have citizenship. I mean, they have their, their kind of legal belonging in the country, but they still have this sort of subordinate status in many ways. So that kind of um, ethnic hierarchy and what it's meant is a huge part of, of Myanmar's politics. And it's also, as well as being, you know, it's a question of ethnicity and identity, but it's also about geography. So you have this, the country is a kind of diamond shape and basically the center of the diamond is majority Bamar or Burman. And then around the top in the border areas, you have seven ethnic states. And in each of those ethnic states, the majority population is a non-Bamar ethnicity. So Karen or Kachin or Chin or Mon. Um, and so these areas have had their own sort of struggles for recognition and independence. There's a huge amount of ethnic armed organization, dozens of armed groups operating, and these sort of ongoing struggles for recognition, and they've been going on since since the beginning of independence for, for Myanmar in different ways. So um, yeah, I think your question was about belonging, and I've sort of gone into just trying to summarize ethnic politics, but I think the key, I mean, it's as you, as you sort of said in the question, there's long histories to this, right? There's a colonial history, there's a pre-colonial history, which has sort of used and manipulated and created these categories. And that plays out into the politics that we see today. Um, and, and so the, the kind of construction of ethnicity is also something that is um, hugely important. But the real implications of it at the moment are this um, sort of, uh, I guess, power struggle, struggle for recognition, struggle for belonging that so many ethnic groups are engaged in vis-a-vis -vis the, the majority Burman. And it's one of the few areas post-coup that people are sort of feeling maybe slightly almost more optimistic about because one of the experiences that we've seen since the coup is that the violence of the military is being used much more against the Bamar, the young people, the, the sort of civil disobedience movement, the young people who are standing up for democracy. And, and they're sort of in a really terrible way experiencing that military violence. But that military violence has been going on in ethnic areas for decades. And so I think it's, it's bringing a bit more understanding to people who had sort of fallen for a certain amount of propaganda that these people, ethnic armed organizations were terrorists, they wanted to destroy Myanmar, they were a threat to the nation. 
And I think it's um, perhaps making a bit more mainstream understanding that actually maybe these, these ethnic armed organizations had some sort of um, right on their side after all. So there's maybe some scope for a little bit of optimism that, that post coup, some of these kind of dynamics of difference might be changed a little bit. So if I'm understanding correctly, the idea is that perhaps um, the Bamar and um, the civilians in the kind of center of the country who are now being targeted by state violence, um, you know, these people who were more legally visible um, in comparison to ethnic minority groups who had been the, the object of much um, military violence in the past, that these people will perhaps extend more um, of an understanding about um, the the military violence in the border regions, um, and that that could kind of create some some ethnic reconciliation. Yeah, I think so. They're now sort of understanding that it's not just the dynamics of difference or the sense that you know these ethnic armed organizations were trying to undermine the the union of Myanmar. They're understanding that actually these people were being you know that violence and, and persecution was being used in against people in ways that were unjust and that actually the, the, the these organizations and the people that they represent might have been um, you know more sympathetic and more correct after all because part of it is also that the student protesters are when they're seeking to kind of find some sort of refuge from the military violence they're also going to the ethnic areas to try to both sign up to learn about fighting to to actually actively take up arms themselves or to learn about how to do that but also because they see it as a place of kind of potential refuge where they can get some kind of sanctuary so it's starting to make them view these these areas and the people who live in them I think a bit differently that's the hope anyway and um, maybe it's too naive to just say that this will lead to some kind of, you know, rainbow nation understanding of Myanmar. But I guess it's a prospect that's there. And perhaps, you know, hopefully I think there's you can certainly see in the kind of social media and the sort of statements of the young protesters and the younger generation there's a very different kind of rhetoric and a very different kind of understanding. So, you know, how representative that is of the, the country as a whole is quite difficult to judge from the outside right now, but it certainly indicates, you know, a discourse that wasn't there before. What can neighboring states um, or international institutions or, um, you know, any kind of international actor with coercive power do to extend uh, protection to these demonstrators um, throughout this this transitional period, it's so difficult. I mean, I am, I think, getting increasingly kind of cynical as I get older, and I'm not sure if that's a very good um, place to start here because I guess you have to have some sort of sense of what is possible and how things might change. I mean, I think China is always the the sort of big actor that has power and weight and influence. So, you know. China has, it, it would seem that, that China is not very happy about the coup either. You know, there hasn't been much support for the, the, the SAC, the, the new military junta, from forthcoming from China. But, you know, Russia has cozied up a bit to take that place. So that means that we don't have, I mean, without trying to get into much to the international law side of it, the possibility of taking any action through the Security Council requires this. Um, requires that there's not a veto by any of the five permanent members. And the problem in any Myanmar related action is that, that um, China and or Russia are likely to block any kind of concerted international action. So that would really require a state that wanted to take strong coercive action, as you put it, to act outside of existing international law parameters. And it's hard to see what would be in any, what would be in that for any neighboring state, really, because you have a huge, very powerful military. And, you know, why would you, why would you actively kind of take, put your, insert yourself into that conflict as a neighboring state? So, yeah, I'm skeptical in, for those reasons about the possibility of a kind of international armed intervention. 
I think there is certainly a sense that some of the surrounding nations are losing patience with Myanmar, like they did not want this coup to take place. And the, the sort of attitude that we're seeing from ASEAN is much more critical than we would typically see, than we would have seen, you know, in the, the military junta years of the past. So, yeah, I guess diplomacy is certainly a possibility. Armed action for me seems unlikely unless China really decides that this is in its interests to do that and somehow Russia can be brought on board. But it's, it's difficult for me at the moment to see a quick end to the coup. I mean, I think when it first happened, I felt that there was a sort of small window in which it could almost have been reversed really quickly, like it didn't happen. But now it's really bedded in and I... I struggle to see a way out at this point, which, as I say, makes me feel a bit sort of hopelessly cynical, but it's it's hard to see where the where the leverage is um, and where you would kind of. Who or what could intervene in a way to really just reverse what has happened and go back to the position we were in in January 2020, January 21. So based on some things um, that I've read, generally Lang is very interested in guaranteed protection from prosecution for his uh, activities as military leader. Um, is there the potential to extend um, some degree of impunity uh, in exchange for him stepping down uh, and for the military to return power Um to Suu Kyi or to another um, democratically elected government? Um, and if, if impunity isn't an option, why not? I mean, I think it's very difficult because there isn't, in a sense, a single institution that's empowered to just give that grant of impunity. And any institution that tried to do that would understandably come in for a huge criticism because so, you know, the entire edifice of international criminal law is constructed around the idea of no impunity, no peace without justice, no amnesty for international crimes. So it would be very difficult to, to give a kind of guarantee of that that could um, that 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 could be viewed as both legally acceptable and internationally politically acceptable, although I don't think we should be so concerned about international perceptions. I think we should be concerned with what people inside Myanmar would want. Um, and I do feel like at the moment there is a bit of momentum. Um, there's quite a lot of advocacy around international criminal law and the International Criminal Court should take on an investigation against Min Aung Lai and there should be an arrest warrant issued for him. And so there's been there's been a fair amount of, of fairly prominent advocacy on that topic. And I guess that has potential risks for exactly the reasons that you suggest. You know, if one of his anxieties is fear of international prosecution, which supposedly we're led to believe it is. I mean, again, it's very difficult to know what is going on in his head. But yeah, that that so we've heard for many years, this has been a fear of military leadership that they would be brought before the ICC. And there were various theories that the reforms from 2010 were designed precisely to to kind of avert that outcome. And here they are back, you know, in the back in that with a much more realistic prosecution of the most, much more realistic possibility of prosecution. So, um, yeah, I think there's a bit of a risk that if the ICC ad advocacy becomes the way forward and the ICC opens an investigation, then you end up really entrenching that sense that they are, you know, they're, they're, you raise the stakes in which there is no way that they will leave office because they, I mean, not that remaining in office is necessarily protection from um, prosecution and international criminal law, but you, you sort of reinforce the idea that they're not going anywhere um, and that they're going to hold on to power for as long as they possibly can, because if they lose it, they'll be very, very vulnerable. And yeah, I think that's something that, you know, does need to be considered. And possibly if there were to be negotiations at some point, that's likely to be the kind of thing that's going to be discussed. But yeah, ultimately, uh, a kind of internal Myanmar agreement will not be able to guarantee amnesty in international law and yeah so it, it sort of remains to be seen but I'm a bit um, I'm a bit wary about the possibility of whether an ICC investigation would actually hurt or help right now 
just because the time frame is I think you, the perception probably for people inside Myanmar is that international, the ICC has some kind of police force that can just fly in and arrest Minang Lai and that will be it and they'll take him away and then there can, you know, it'll be like it didn't happen. But of course, that's not how it works. So I don't know that there will be a very good grasp for a lot of people that that it could be a decade later and still, you know, the ICC could issue an arrest warrant, but that's no guarantee that, that there will be an arrest. We'd be sort of counting on Minang Lai being extradited, which obviously he's not going to do as to himself. And he's going to be too savvy to travel to a country that would be likely to, to extradite him. So we could end up really with the sort of situation that we saw with Sudan and a former president, al-Bashir, where there's been an arrest warrant since 2009 or so, um, but he's still not in ICC custody and really he'll only end up there because um, if and because the power dynamics in Sudan have, have, have sort of changed to remove his power. And I guess you could see some sort of similar scenario for Myanmar, like unless the ICC in and of itself is not going to be able to change the power dynamics inside Myanmar to reduce Minang Lai's power, but it might entrench him further to hold on to power. Thank you, Kirsten. That was um, really informative, really interesting to hear your perspective on these uh, issues. If there's anything I didn't mention that you wanted to talk about, um, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have any final comments, any any um, bigger conclusions um, that you'd like to end with. Yeah, I don't think I really have probably the only concluding comment, I guess, which just ties back to what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of the role of community is that it's, I suppose, what yeah, from all of my research in Myanmar, but also elsewhere, like any of these kind of processes about what happens in terms of justice and accountability and transitional justice really need to be led much more from below and by people themselves. And we hear that rhetoric a lot. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not by any means novel to say that, but it's still really poorly implemented. And I think all of my research is in so much sort of capacity and knowledge at the local level, at community level, among people who are sort of actively affected by conflict and affected by what's happening at the moment in Myanmar. And yeah, I don't think international elite actors are still very good at that, at engaging with that. And it's not that they don't know it's there because they exploit it, you know. Um, we engage with those sorts of local actors and use their knowledge all the time. And that's how most international agencies and analysts and academics are, are kind of building and developing their knowledge. But there's not nearly enough that's done to kind of really make those people powerful in decision making and policy making and yeah if we are back to the ICC conversation I suppose that kind of makes me nervous that if these sorts of debates are happening by people who are outside and ultimately not bearing the brunt of if it goes wrong then we have to be I think pretty cautious about what we're advocating and make sure that those demands are led much more by what people inside Myanmar want and the compromises that they are prepared to tolerate and not by our sort of views on that. Yeah, that's a wonderful note to end it on. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for your time.